so glad you guys are here. Um, I'm sharing, we're, during the summer, we're in between uh, series. Uh, we'll be starting a series in August uh, that's going to be called Elephants in the Room. We're, re- go- we're, go- we're going to address some topics that aren't typically addressed in church, that we haven't officially addressed in church, uh, that are somewhat controversial. Uh, and so we're just going to go ahead and bite the bullet in all of its beautiful awkwardness and address these things, make sure that the word of God goes forth in truth and in power. So that's going to be coming in August. But for now, we're kind of preaching as the Lord leads from week to week. And um, in light of all this, uh, I've heard a lot about love recently. Love wins, um, that, you know, love is prevailing and all that. And I believe love wins. I believe love is prevailing. I think you have to define what love is. I think you have to be careful. But I've been thinking, you know, what, what does love look like for the believer? What does love look like? And and to me, love has a balancing act that the Lord is asking us to do. Um, So I want to look at the scripture here. Uh, We're going to go to um, John 13 because Jesus instructs us to love like he does. Jesus instructs us to love like he does. And so John 13, you're going to see that and you're going to see how important this is. It says this, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Now, this is a huge, huge deal. Just just so you know, the context of this teaching, uh, they're at the Last Supper, right? Jesus is about to be betrayed. As a matter of fact, Judas has just left the room, Okay. Judas has left the room. Jesus is here with his disciples, and he starts his final moment of teaching with his now 11 disciples. And this is point one for all the things that he's about to teach them until he finally goes to the garden and is betrayed. Okay, so that's where we are in the story of Jesus. And he starts out this teaching. He says, hey, I'm about to go. You can't go where I'm going. So listen up. You need to love others in the way that I've loved you. And this is the way. This is the way that people will be able to tell that you belong to me by how you love. That's a big deal. That's a really big deal. He could have chosen so many different things to say. They'll know you're Christians by your Bible knowledge. They'll know you're Christians by your bumper stickers. They'll know you are Christians by how you dress. They'll know you're Christians by all these different ways. But instead, he says, they will know that you belong to me by how you love one another. So this is important. This is, we have to get this right. Because if we get this right, then we're messing up what one of the last things Jesus instructed his followers to do, right? So that begs the question then, how do we do it? How do we love like Jesus did? Well, I believe it's done by embracing grace and truth. Embracing grace and truth. Um, you can turn, I'm going to have it on the, uh, on the overhead behind me, but John chapter 1, 14, 16, and 17 says this. It says, the word became flesh. Now, by the way, the word is Jesus, okay? The word is Jesus. We call our Bibles the word of God. The Bible points to whom? Jesus, Right? So it's the, it's the written word of God, but the alive personhood of the word is Jesus Christ. So the word, Jesus, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Y'all know that. That's why we celebrate Christmas. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. We're going to skip verse 15. For just It's a tangent. Verse 16, out of his fullness... We've already received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth, there it is again, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So how do we love like Jesus? Scripture tells us that God is love. Scripture tells us that Jesus is the most recent, clearest expression of who God is. So we have to love like Jesus. And Scripture says that Jesus came in grace and in truth. Now, Notice, he doesn't say he came in half grace and half truth. He says he came in the fullness of grace, 100% grace, 100% truth. I always think it's funny when I was playing sports when I was in high school or whatever, my coach would say, all right, boys, I want you to give 110%. And I always thought, that's impossible. 
I mean, I get what you're saying. You want me to give my all, but my all is 100% mathematically. 100% is as much as, if I were to give 110%, I would be exceeding my personal limits, and you're asking me to do something I can't do. And then he'd smack me, and I'd run laps. But as, as, as different as it sounds, we actually are called, and this is what Jesus said, he was 100% grace, he was 100% truth. Now, in order to balance grace and truth, it, it takes equal parts. If you balance, you have to have the same amount on both sides. Uh, Chris, will you come and demonstrate something for me real quick? I have some weights down here. These are 25s and these are 10s. So Chris's left hand is going to represent grace, and Chris's right hand is going to represent truth. Now, I want you <laughs> I want you to press those things. So put them up and then and lift them up at the same time. How, how is that for you? You doing all right? Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Okay, switch, okay, well, maybe we're out of balance. So let's switch hands. So let's put 10 in your right hand and 25 in your left hand. So let's do a little bit more truth and grace this time. How 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 is that feeling? How are we doing? About the same. <laughs> About the same. All right. Now put down uh, and and get the equal amounts on either side. And he chooses the twenty five because he's just like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, cool. Now, if you've ever lifted weights, you know how. Thank you, Chris. Y'all give Chris a hand for his brute strength. He's made us all look like children. All right. So now if you've ever lifted weights, you know that if, if you were like to, to get on a, like a bench press where you lay down and you, and you press up like that, if you put a 10 on one side and a 45 on one side, that's going to be a problem. See, in order to have balance, you have to have equal weights on both sides, right? And so what the Lord is asking us to do is to have equal, equal weight of grace and truth. Now, first, we have to define these words. Grace, grace, you've probably heard God's unmerited favor. That's a good definition. This is the one that I like. It's God's willingness to work on your behalf even though you don't deserve it. God's willingness to work on your behalf even though you don't deserve it. Now, right now, there's a lot of teaching that's going out that says that grace and mercy are basically synonymous, that they mean the same thing. Mercy is passive. Mercy is relenting. If you smack me in the face and I don't smack you back, I showed you mercy. Okay, because I had every right to smack you back according to the law, right? Right, an eye for an eye, a tooth for the tooth, right? And you guys are like, yeah, man. So, so I have every right to do that, but I chose not to. I show mercy. I relent, and I'm passive. What grace would do, though, is grace would sit down with the guy that smacked you and said, hey, look, here's why you don't do this. And here's an anger management booklet. And here's what you can do to not do this in the future. See, grace is active. Grace is God's willingness to work on your behalf. And you don't deserve this. This is not something that you can do on your own. He does what you cannot do. Imagine that you are standing in front of a huge building and you've been summoned and you must appear inside that building at 1 p.m. this afternoon. And you go up to the building and, and, and you're looking at it and there's a big door. You try the door and it's locked. Oh, no. If I'm not there by 1 p.m., stuff's going to go down. So I walk around the side. I, oh, there's another door. Great. Maybe this one's open. It's locked. I go all the way around. Every door is locked. Every window is locked. I can't get in the building, right? But I've been called to do that. I'm supposed to be in there by 1 o'clock. What grace would do is grace would unlock the door for you. Grace would unlock the door. It would do what you can't do for yourself. It would do what you can't do. And that's what Jesus in his sacrifice does for us. He does what we can't do for ourselves. He gives us the ability to be one with the Father. Okay? Do we deserve it? No. But does he do it? Yes. And so it's his action on our behalf. It's his empowerment. Grace gives us the option to change. See, without the grace of God, you cannot change yourself. If there's a sin that you're committing on a regular basis and you know you need to stop it, you can try really, really hard on some good behavior modification techniques and have maybe a little bit, a little bit of success, probably in public and then behind closed doors, you would still continue in that sin. 
right? Because the behavior modification didn't change your heart. And your heart is what leads to your actions. So what God wants to do is he wants to give you grace, all right? Think about it like this. How many of you have a credit card? How many of you wish that you never got that credit card? (laughs) Okay, so a credit card has a grace period, right? So say you're... uh, your bill, you you were supposed to pay on your bill on the first of the month. Well, what happens is if you aren't able to pay for whatever reason, they give you a grace period. They say, okay, you've got 20 more days to get the money in. That's grace. It's an opportunity for you to make things right. Now, the credit card's grace period isn't saying, okay, you don't owe us money anymore, is it? No, credit card companies don't don't have any mercy. That would be mercy. Right, but they do have grace. They do. They give you a window of opportunity in which to get your junk together, and to pay at least the minimum amount that they need in order before they start slapping you with fines. Right, and and that's what the grace of God does for us. He gives us a window of opportunity. He says, "Hey, I'm going to relent, not because you don't have to do this, not because you don't have to walk." and live righteously, but because I'm going to give you a chance to to allow me to change your heart and your life and to live the way that I've called you to live. Does that make sense? That's what true grace is. It's different than mercy. So we're supposed to be walking in grace towards others. What does that mean? That means we don't immediately give up on them. It means that we don't write them off just because they're doing what's wrong. It means that just like their heavenly father who thought that Jesus' blood was worth their lives, that we treat them according to, to what Jesus paid for them. Amen? So that's what walking in grace is. Well, what about truth? Truth is what's right according to God. It's simply what truth. Truth is what's right according to God. Now, we live in a pluralistic society where people think that there are all these different versions of truth. Well, this is my truth. This is what I believe. And this is your truth. This is what you believe. And let's just, let's just agree that we are, we're both true. Well, that doesn't make any sense. By pure definition of truth, only one, you know, only one can be right. Are, are you with me? And so truth is always truth, no matter what. If, if you feel bad about it, if you don't like it, it doesn't matter, it's truth. And if anyone ever tells you there's no absolute truth, then just ask them, is that true? And if they say yes, then they just exploded their own argument. <laughs> okay? There is an absolute truth. There is a truth. And we know that it's according to the word of God. Amen? So here's the thing. There's this tension, though. There's grace. Give people a chance to get right with the Lord. Don't judge them. Right? Don't, don't write them off. Be long-suffering. Be patient. There's grace. And there's truth. What they're doing is wrong, and they better change. Grace and truth. And they, see, they seemingly seem at odds with each other. Right? And, and we know this because most of us choose one. Most of us fall either in the grace camp, oh, just, we're just going to love people, we're just going to love them. And then others fall into the truth camp, hey, man, you can't be around me if you're doing that. Well, well what's the deal? The deal is, is that depending on how we were raised, we tend to go towards one of these or the other. If you're a truth person, then grace seems really uncertain, very inconsistent, and it's kind of confusing. Well, why am I letting them continue to do what's wrong even though I know it's right? It, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense if you're a truth person. If you're a grace person, truth seems arrogant, unaccommodating, and just too simplistic. Look, it's not that simple. And the truth guy's over there going, yeah, it is. Here's the scripture. And the grace person's going, yeah, but they don't know. And, and so there's this tension, right? Guys, I, I don't want you to get rid of the tension. I want you to live in the tension. That's what Jesus did. As a matter of fact, walking in grace and truth led to some really uncomfortable moments with Jesus where he, was, where he was doing the fullness of grace and the fullness of truth. If you're really comfortable in your truth, then you don't have enough grace. If you're really comfortable in your grace, you don't have enough truth. There should be a tension. And you should constantly be asking yourself, is this right? What does the scripture say? Let's, let's look at Jesus. I want to give you three quick, and, and I could preach a sermon, maybe even multiple sermons, on each one of these interactions that Jesus had with people. I'm not going to do it this morning uh, because I want you to get the point 
uh, of what we're what we're getting. But you can go back and study these on your own. So Matthew nine. 9 through 12 is the story of when Jesus calls Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector, all right? Now, I know you don't like the IRS, but the tax collectors back then were way worse than the IRS, okay? Can't get into it now. They were basically like the mafia. They stole from people. They were, um, they, they were traitors to their own country. It, it, was, it was bad, all right? You always see uh, tax collectors and prostitutes put together in the Bible, all right? If that lets you know kind of like what's going on. So verse 9, Jesus is walking along. He sees a man named Matthew sitting in his tax collector's booth. And he looks at him. He says, follow me and be my disciple. So Matthew got up and followed him. Why why is it not that easy for us? (laughs) Right? Hey, follow me. Matthew's like, okay. (laughs) There we go. Conversion. There it is. There it is. By the way, that's the only requirement to be a disciple of Jesus. You just say, okay. And start following me. There are no other hoops to jump through. Amen. Verse 10. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Okay, here are the truth people. (laughs) Don't see a lot of grace in that. Right? These are the truth people. Now, were the Pharisees right? Were the tax collectors and all the people of ill repute, were they doing what was wrong? No. Yeah, tax collectors were stealing. The Bible says don't steal, right? But, verse 12, when Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. Now, did Jesus negate the truth that they were doing wrong? No, he said that they were sick people. <laughs> he said that they were in need. But, but did that mean that he shunned them and he pushed them away? No, it said, my gosh, you of all people need to understand the grace of God. You of all people need to have an encounter with me. Do you see? So Jesus walked in tension of grace and truth. Let's look at the next one. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. This, guys, sometimes we just miss out on the funny stuff that's in the Bible. This is pretty funny. We're so busy trying to, Lord, what do you mean by this? Well, sometimes it's just funny. So one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. Jesus was always going to dinner at other people's houses, right? So Jesus, that's why they accused him of being a glutton, I guess. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When certain immoral woman from the city heard, which they're being really nice here, certain immoral woman, she's a prostitute, everyone. Everyone knew she was a prostitute. She dressed like it. She acted like it. She talked like it, Okay. So the Bible's being a certain immoral woman okay, from the city heard that he was eating there. She brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Verse 38, then she knelt behind him at his feet weeping. Her tears fell on his feet and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. Well, that's weird. It's really weird. Okay, just so you know, the way that the Jews ate, they had a really low table, not a high table. They didn't sit in chairs. They actually reclined on their side. Okay? So there's a low table. Gee, I'm not going to do it here, okay? But there's, because I might not get up. But, but, so they're reclining like this and they eat like this. Really awkward. I'm like, I'm like, how does your arm not fall asleep? But, but, so, so Jesus reclined, so his feet are stretched out for him. Well, there's a woman, a prostitute, who's crying so much that her tears are like getting the sand off of his feet and she's kissing his feet. That's weird. And, and can you, I mean, I would be like, "Ah," like laughing, like being tickled, trying to eat while some ladies home. I'd be like, Tiff, come here. You know, (laughs) this is a weird situation. Okay. It really is. So, verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Truth. Truth. She's a sinner. Jesus didn't know. Jesus answered his thoughts. Whoa, just, that's a word of knowledge, by the way. He didn't say that out loud. He was thinking it, and Jesus knew he was thinking it. Jesus answered his thoughts and said, Simon, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher. He was just thinking bad about him. Oh, okay, yeah, right. Right? Pharisee. Verse 41, then Jesus told him the story. A man loans money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces of silver to the other. But neither of them could repay. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose 
loved him more after that. Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. No, that makes sense. If you owe me, if someone owes me a hundred bucks, someone else owes me ten bucks, I say, ah, don't worry about it. The guy that owed, that owed me ten bucks is like, okay, sweet. But the guy that owed me a hundred bucks is like, wow, really? Oh, thank you so much, right? There's so much more appreciation for what was done. So then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash my dust from my feet. It was a walking uh, culture. They didn't have cars and stuff like that. So they walked everywhere. And so it was common to show a sign of respect and honor to a guest. You would usually have a servant or someone with a bowl of water, and they would wash their feet. Simon didn't do this to Jesus, right? He was, he was kind of a snub almost, like, well, we're not going to wash your feet. But she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I, it was a, called, you know, greet each other with a holy kiss. It was a uh, kiss on the cheek on both sides. But from the time I came in, she's not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, again, customary, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you her sins, and they are many. They're many. Jesus, Jesus never said that she wasn't a sinner, never said that what, she, that what she wasn't doing was wrong, did he? He did uphold the truth. I'll tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. They've been forgiven. Again, grace and truth. Grace allowed, th- this woman shouldn't have, I mean, this is the son of God we're talking about. Like, like. And then here we have a, a, a woman that who knows what she's done all of her life. She was obviously well-known in the community, which makes me wonder why the Pharisees knew. Anyway, but that's a whole different. Mm. So, so, so here she is. It would have been well within Jesus' right to say, hey, listen, lady, um, this is really important. I'm trying to minister to the Pharisees, so it's important to me that you're not seen around me. Like, I, I accept you and everything, but... But for now, if you would just kind of take a break, um, because the, it's really going to offend the Pharisees if you're here. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. Even though he didn't, he didn't lower the standard of sin. He says, "Oh, she's a sinner, and and she's done many sins." He still, he still accepted her. He still accepted her. Last one here, John eight, and then we're going to bring this all together. This is one of my favorites. This is the story of the woman caught in adultery. I could just talk about this forever. Um, you know the story. She was brought, um, caught in the very act. There's no question whether or not she's guilty. She's thrown at Jesus' feet with a bunch of Pharisees who are about to stone her according to the Old Testament law. They already have stones in their hands. I mean, like, like it, for them, it's a done deal. And they say, oh, well, let's just ask Jesus about this. Hold on a second. Hey, Jesus. So the law says, she was caught in adultery. So the law says that we should stone her. What do you think? And Jesus says, oh, you know, that's, that's true. That's what the law says. Um, tell you what, whichever one of you has never sinned, be my guest. And one by one, they all drop their stones and they walk away. And let's pick it up. Verse 10, Jesus stood up and he said to the woman, the whole time he was drawn in the dirt, which is hilarious. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? Verse 11, no, Lord. Neither do I go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. He didn't say, well, neither do I. You're doing fine, sweetie. Didn't say that, did he? He said, I don't condemn you. Look, I know you've had a rough life. I know, you know, um, all this happened to you in your past and stuff. So it's okay. Keep living the way you're living. He didn't say that, did he? He said, go and sin no more. Now, first, he defended her and he accepted her. We've talked about that. That's dad's way. The Father's way is to defend, accept, then disciple. We try to disciple before we defend and accept. We have it backwards. But according to Scripture, we defend, we accept, then we disciple. Right? you you got to catch a fish before you clean it. Ever tried to clean a fish while it's still in the pond? Enjoy. I won't be there with you. It's pointless. It's pointless. It's pointless. you got to catch them first. So you defend and you accept, then you disciple. It's Dad's way. Okay? Um... So, again, we see in all these examples, Jesus calls sin, sin, and that's the truth. He never stops being true, but he then gives the people the empowerment, the grace, the time to leave their sin and to walk in new life. You see how that works? See, we've made a mistake as a church. We, we've tried to either get rid of truth 
or get rid of grace. But you can't get rid of truth because truth correctly identifies the problem. Y'all, y'all know the scripture that says that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. It's John chapter 8. It's, this, it's the same scripture, same chapter where we just were with a woman that was caught in adultery. A bunch of people get saved. Verse 30, many who heard him, Jesus, say these things, believed in him. So they believe in Jesus. So what does he say? He says, when you, um, he says, verse 31, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, if you are truly my disciples, if you remain faithful to my, uh, sorry, you are truly my disciples, if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's the context of that verse. We kind of ripped it out and turned it into a bumper sticker. So what's he saying? He's saying, look, if you want to be a follower of Jesus, yet you don't embrace his teachings as truth, then you're not doing it right. Because what sets us free is the proper diagnosis, right? If if you go to a doctor and you're complaining of stomach pain, like, doc, man, my stomach is killing me all the time. It doesn't matter what I eat. He goes, okay, I've got some migraine medicine I want to give you. Right? We need to go ahead and, like, pull the dude's license or whatever, right? Because he's not diagnosing the problem correctly, right? He's applying the, the, the wrong solution. You have to be able to diagnose the problem. In order to diagnose the problem, the sin in my life, in your life, and in the world's life, we look to the Word. And it's the truth, and it doesn't change. It may be 2,000 years old when it was written, but God's not abandoned His truth. He's not said, well, that was then. Things have changed now. You've got the Internet, so... He doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. The truth is still the truth, amen? And we cannot neglect it. But in the same way, grace is God's solution to the problem. And so we can't neglect that. We can't let go of grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, It is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. God's plan A, step one, and the only plan and the only step, For your salvation is His grace. It's the only thing that's going to change your heart. It's the only thing that's going to change the heart. We can make laws all day. We can make people follow the Old Testament all day. It's not going to change their heart. We've got to apply the grace of the Lord to everyone we come in contact with. Amen? It's what you want for you. So let's apply it to everyone else as well. So do you see how we have to have both grace and truth in operation? I want to share the scripture. This is the last thing I want to share with you. This is Romans chapter 2, 3, and 4. It's in the message. I love the way it phrases it. It says, you didn't think, did you, that just by pointing your finger at others, you would distract God from seeing all of your misdoings and from coming down on you hard? Or did you think that because he's such a nice God, He let you off the hook. Better think this one through from the beginning. God is kind, but he's not soft. In kindness, he takes us firmly by the hand and leads us into a radical life change. Isn't that good? God is kind. He is merciful. He loves you. He's got wonderful things for you. And he doesn't withdraw his love for you just because you're doing something wrong. But... He's not soft on sin. He knows what it does to you. And he's not willing to let you stay in your sin because it hurts you and it hurts the others around you. He's not willing to amend his truth because it's not what's best for you. So guys, the question for us, the church this morning, is are you walking love's balancing act? Are you doing equal parts grace, equal parts truth? Let's stand for prayer. Thank you, Lord. I just want us to take a moment and do personal inventory. You can close your eyes just so there are no distractions. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, what is my tendency? Am I a grace person? Am I a truth person? Or am I already balancing the two? Just ask him. This is just for you. Just for you and the Lord. Be honest. Do I tend towards grace? Do I tend towards truth? 
Now, here's your prayer. If you're a truth person, congratulations. That's awesome. You need to ask the Lord for more, for more grace for others. Just ask him right now under your breath in your own words, Lord, Lord, teach me how to walk in grace. If you're a grace person, congratulations. The world needs grace. But you need to make sure you don't neglect the truth. So just under your breath right now to the Lord, just say, Lord, teach me your truth. Help me not back down from what your word says is true. If you feel like you're walking in, in balance, in grace and truth, I want you to pray to the Lord and say, Lord, put more weight on each side. Teach me how to do even more. Thank you, Lord. You have full permission full access to my heart. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. We're going to have the altar ministry team. They're going to be on this side of the stage. I went about 10 minutes over. Thank you guys so much for staying with me. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Everyone's gone from the restaurant now. So you're going to be able to go straight there. <laughs> so it's all good. If you need something, wow, what a, what a great morning. Holy cow. We saw people get healed, right? We felt the presence of the Lord in like a manifest way. And I think the preaching was awesome. So it was a good morning. But but if we didn't if we didn't call out like something that you're specifically dealing with and you want prayer, it's what these guys are for. They would love to pray with you. They'll stay here as long as they need to to pray with you. They love you. They've been believing God for you before you even knew they were an option for you. Okay? So come, uh, I'm going to pray a prayer of dismissal. You'll be uh, available to leave when I say amen and uh, either leave and go and be an awesome light to the world or leave and come here and receive what you need from the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Lord, you're so good to us. You're so full of grace and you're so full of truth. And Lord, we want to be like you. Who else is there to be like? We want to be like you, so help us walk in grace and truth. Lord, help us be a people, Lord, that can balance balance loves balancing acts lord and as we go father as we go father may we just just diffuse your fragrance everywhere that we go and may we have salty language father so that people might be thirsty for you may we shine our light god so that people might realize how dark they are and we thank you lord for your presence and your goodness in jesus name amen amen love you guys see you next week